David Remnick choose the drawings that they're going to buy. Ah, took me a little while to get that. And each person is doing between five and 15 cartoons a week. I see about a thousand cartoons a week overall. Maybe four or five hundred from our major contributors, maybe 200 here in person. Everybody else faxes in. Watching the cartoonists gather for their weekly meeting, I think about mom's yearning to be here, artwork in hand. This is a sort of holy grail for new cartoonists, a chance to be part of a long held tradition and rub shoulders with magazine regulars. I admire a lot of the older guys that started what we do. What I'm lucky enough to be part of is, you know, this history. They say that your ambition shouldn't to be, you know, I want to get in the New Yorker magazine. Your ambition should be, I want to do the best work I can, and I want to work as hard as I can, which means trying to produce 10 or 15 ideas every week for a year to find out who you are as a comic artist. Okay, there I am. Here we go. Sam? I mean, Sam's done 25,000 cartoons. Yeah, I got a lot of cat stuff this time. Well, you certainly have a lot of cat cartoons here. Cats licking their generals is probably not going to go. Why not? Huh. I got 23,000, uh, 23,000, close to 23,300, so. Sam is a classic gag cartoonist. He is going to manipulate the world in ways that are very funny. You can always relate to what Sam is saying. Funny. What the hell? <laughs> there may be a caption, and there is definitely a drawing. Let's say that they're pretty well drawn. Are they dark humor? Some of them are. Some of them are outright sick. If you're funny, you can get away with anything. The binders are, are my gag ideas. There are 200 to each one. The last is 22,800. There, I got to get make room for some more of these things. This I got from an old gag. Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. All of a sudden I got a variation going on on this thing. You get this graphic image and you go with it. You, know, you milk it until there's no milk left. Then you leave it for a couple of weeks and you find out there's some more milk there. You go back to it and, and you, you do it some more. And then I got another one. I need a waxing. I, I had to draw the woman, which was somebody who waxes. You go to art school? Not really. I took art courses at uh, City College, the business school. And then I took some courses at School of Visual Arts. Not much. All I remember is I was six years old and I wanted to be a cartoonist. My family didn't understand. You want to be a cartoonist. You know, people's attitude toward this thing is that, you know, it, it's, <clears throat> it's you, you, you're some sort of freak of nature. <laughs> Moved to the country, had to learn how to drive, took lessons from the middle school chemistry teacher. He used to yell at me. Would you say that the people in your cartoons are a little neurotic sometimes? I think they worry about things. Neurotic just sounds so derogatory. <laughs> Unless you mean it in a kind of complimentary way. <laughs> if somebody tells them, be a happy camper or wake up and smell the coffee, this is not the direction that they're going to go in. There are certain in intersections, like we're coming up to one in a little while. I'm cautious. I think because I learned as an adult, the whole thing really scares me. If it's really raining, I won't have the radio on. I know I need like all of my attention. This is the intersection. You see, it's a little bit weird. It's four ways, but they're very far apart. You see, now I'm like actually a mess. Looks like they're letting me go, but maybe not. But see, that guy was like a little bit queer because he's from New Jersey. Um, and he almost went, but he knew if he went, I, I would just so hit him. I really did not see my home as being in the New Yorker. This was in 78, and nothing that they were running looked anything. They, I mean, they did like panel, like gag cartoons. And I was 
doubly shocked when he showed me the one that they were buying because it was really oddball. My stuff was weird compared to the New Yorker, but this was weird compared to me. These weird little shapes with names that made me kind of laugh. I think when they ran it, people like really hated it. It expanded the idea of what a cartoon could be. You couldn't have somebody else who was trying to draw like Roz or think like Roz. This one just ran. This is recipes from Second Rate Mom magazine. Uh, chicken a la guilt. He says, on your way home from work or your Pilates class or whatever, pick up a pre-cooked chicken. Serve while pretending it doesn't matter that you didn't make it yourself. A lot of things that are so-called like conventional tastes really don't make me laugh. I mean, I don't understand sitcoms. This was sort of something that I always liked to do from when I was really little. I was an only child. And uh, I like to read, I like to draw, um, I like to be inside. I did play outside some, but it was a little, ner you know, made me a little nervous. You know, you could fall. Has that changed as, as time has progressed? Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> Not really. Uh, you know, I still like to stay indoors and draw. That seems to be the safest path for me. <laughs> Is there a part of you in these characters? I think definitely. There's a lot of things that I feel like I can say better, you know, in my drawings. Oh, the inspiration for this one, this one is pretty easy to say what, what inspired this. This was, I was on my book tour. And when you stay at like chic or hotels, you get to choose what kind of pillow you'd like. And it actually started to make me laugh. I mean, Falafel filled, property of the merchant marines, filled with cheese. Wet and sticky. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'd like to rest my head on <laughs> Who's next? Whoever was going to come in? The Anna Magnani of cartooning oh, here, Magnani. You're gorgeous, Mag dear. I do pugs a lot. I'm good with uh, cattle. <laughs> I'm very good with Holstein cows that have the spots. <laughs> it's a great cartoon. Lovely people. <laughs> Lovely people. I was born in New York City. From 4 to 13, I lived in Mexico. And then we went to Australia. I do have a bit of an accent, light, and I haven't been able to have that removed. <laughs> what I'm doing when I do the cartoons is actually I'm never even thinking about being funny. I'm looking at character, and I'm looking at the way people think. It's really love of dialogue. <laughs> Oh, Victoria, you have the Are they all? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was looking, I was looking at them this side, and I thought, oh. Upside down, you know how that and upsets me. And not only me. that, I, now your wallet is on the table. Uh, Bob, is that, uh... Money Talks. Is that... <laughs> the Victoria Roberts cartoon is, you know, more observational rather than imaginational. These are wonderful cartoons, and they're sweet, and we have more empathy with them. I also deal mostly with older people. That's sort of my group, and it always has been. I use the same characters. I draw them in the same position. The fact that they've been sitting there tells you that they're an old couple, that they've been married for so long, that you know about their communication. I have been married, but only for a year. I remember getting divorced and worrying that I would, I would, I'd had the luxury of being married and getting a lot of ideas from being married that suddenly I would be, you know, unable to do that. Around the world, dee 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 dee, da 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 da, around the world, mm -hmm. and just a puppy, all right. I like to draw Nona who doesn't appear so much in The New Yorker. And usually she's in the nude. She's my strongest character. But the writing's never really clever enough for her. If I put her on stage, I can do it. <laughs> Nona came from working at Mossman Nursing Home. I've been talking in her voice for a long time. I thought, I've just got to go out on stage and see what happens. I think the rest is a bit of all right. 
It is the most grounded work that I have ever done. I really love it. <coughs> You're not keeping it? No, I'm keeping it all these. This one? You gotta hold it. Oh, all right. All right. You lobbied me for that. Okay. All right. Good I'll to see you. you. Oh, take my bag. Not long after my mother died, I made a surprising discovery. Along with ideas and sketches, Mom left behind a pile of finished cartoons. They were so familiar looking to me. I knew they were things Mom might have said or heard. Did she send them anywhere? And I think more than anything, I wondered if someone like Mom, with four children to raise, could put in the hours necessary to make her cartoons stand out. Half of the people I know always coming to me and saying, you know, well, here's, I have these great ideas for a cartoon. I think people feel it's something they could do. It's, it looks really easy, which is, means it's really good. I mean, I think when cartoons are good, they look easy to do. When it's done beautifully in just such a way, you really know what conversation had been going on before, what action had led up to that moment. It's like film, there's this, this, this arc there is a, a past and a present. And you pick out that point when it says the most about what it could be. That bird has to be an actor. You pick exactly the right characters by auditioning them, these little drawings. Oh, that's the wrong face. Get another one, get it next. Not only do you read the caption left to right, left to right, you also read the drawing left to right. And so that detail that makes the joke needs to be you know, sort of on the right side of the page. The captions are real. You know, I hear... Do you hear the language? Yeah, the language. Edgar, please run down to the shopping center right away and get some milk and cat food. Don't get canned tuna or chicken or liver or any of those awful combinations. Shop around and get a surprise. The pussies like surprises. I was submitting every week to The New Yorker, and I didn't get anything. And it occurred to me that, hey, congenital mullet head, you're not laughing at what you've been sending to The New Yorker. So I started sending stuff that I was laughing about, which was not acceptable. But I was laughing, and they invited me in. When George first started showing up in The New Yorker, Oh, God, it was a shock to see this Missouri backwards drawing showing up. This house, and it's human interest. It's the things that we all love, whether we're conscious of it or not. This lamp, Grandma had one. People see that, and their grandma had one, and it adds to the warmth of your, your drawing. The booth thing, you have to be introduced to his world. The whole point of, of the art in the magazine was to bring together a group of talented people who had a recognizable personal style and a point of view. Mrs. Ritterhouse ran for quite a bit in New Yorker. That was a drawing of my mother. She was a one-quarter Cherokee. She had a long chin, black hair divided here, like that. So these are people that you can recognize from growing up in the Midwest? Well, yes. I married into a cat family. We have two inside, two outside. <laughs> His hand's too big. Is it a dog or a cat? <laughs> well, I don't know if something a, went it's wrong. A, <laughs> it's a dad. He's a kind of a mix. <laughs> George Booth was one of my mother's very favorite cartoonists. 
I can't help but think how much she should have been the one to share the day with him, to ask him these questions. She would have loved that. In her studio, I even found an enthusiastic card she had made for him. I guess she never sent it. George doesn't remember receiving it. I still cherish the t-shirt mom gave me with George's most iconic character, his dog, front and back. That English Bull Terrier turned up because I was trying to draw ugly dogs. Tragedy is funny, and ugly can be funny. I never had dogs, and when I draw a, a dog sitting in a room looking the other way, I do that because you and I have made some dumb remark about our life, and the dog looking away from us makes a greater comment than if you saw his face. If you imagine whatever the thought is, it's better than I could draw. This is the heart of the studio the hub. This is my new, my new drawing setup, brand new. I like to see every bit of the way the line works, like that when I draw. The noses are my key signature. I always start, usually, well, I practically always start with a nose. Bonk! There's a honker. This is not going to be straight humor. This is just going to be silly. That character is going to be silly. Everything else in this is going to be silly. The gag is going to be silly. Okay? So that when you look down that, you've got that impression and you go into that world of silly. This is the, the Avarian version of. I don't know if I shake my head as much as I used. It just keeps the, keeps the beat going. And I like like real ink and real pen to draw with because it slows you down. I always loved Arnie Levin's work because I love Arnie's, the simplicity and directness of Arnie's drawing. breaks in the lines, these movements, they're not planned. They just seem to come at certain moments just to let you go in and out and breathe within so that you can become part of the drawing as opposed to being separated and looking down and saying, you know, that's a drawing. Actually, there's, there's one of the card from your mom. Really? Yeah. Can't forget to tell you how much I hate shopping. <laughs> Mom and Arnie were friends, both part of a local cartoonist group. I think he was the first to really explain to Mom how much hard work it would take to get into The New Yorker. It wasn't something she could throw together, last minute, late at night, as Mom was prone to do. But Mom had other dreams, too, dreams not unusual for many of her generation. She wanted to be a wife and mother. She married for love and relished raising her family. She once told me, some people invest in gold, I invest in children. Her art simply took a back seat. Someday I'll do it, she'd say. She proudly hung Arnie's cartoons in her house for inspiration. And because of that, I've always loved his work too. I think your characters are happy characters. Yes. They kind of happy. They are. I like a happy world. I think anybody can do the world we're already in. I did a cartoon based on, on, you know, when you take the sheets and you go like this, right? And that bubble of air comes out on it. And, and your sheet could be perfect, but that was so much fun, you'd do it like two or three times <laughs> just for the bubble of air, you know? It's not great meaning, but it's us having fun. It's us enjoying life. People know that you're like a New Yorker cartoonist. They act differently. They're sort of on their guard. When you sort of look like a biker, they don't take you seriously like cartoonists, see? 
And people are much more themselves. <laughs> I got my leather, no sleeves, you know, the whole, the whole bit. We go to like, you know, we go to biker places where we hang out with other people, swagger around. And... You've done more work since I saw you last. Yes. So I think it's sort of interesting that you are riding a motorcycle, have tattoos. It's not what you expect when you think of a cartoonist that might draw those kinds of drawings. I, I don't think that the drawings have to be you. Some of it is you, and, and that is my outlook. So bikers yeah. can be happy. Bikers can be happy. <laughs> if there's a big market on angry men, I'm going to be in the big time. Frank draws people being angry better than anybody in the world. His angry people should be copyrighted. <laughs> Here we are with Frank Modell having a little tea. The conversation is hot. <laughs> the tea is cold. Frank has been cartooning for more than 70 years, an elder statesman of the New Yorker cartoonists. So amazing and grateful for the, the fact that I'm still alive. Uh, I don't need glasses to see you. Other things, the reason phone book I do. And I don't have any arthritis. I, I'm feeling sexy all the time. He was a great friend of Charlie Adams and was once the assistant to the magazine's art editor. How do you like it so far? So far, so good. See, it's becoming a person. I was very ill as a little kid. I had scarlet fever. And my parents used to bring me coloring books. And because I was sick and because I was the only child, they would encourage me. That's what started all the trouble. Well, I think that's him. Okay. I think he's had it. <laughs> Frank Modell is so modern. I went to a lecture he gave and I said, thought, well, there was no need to have done everything because Frank's already done it. Even though he says he's retired from cartooning, Frank still keeps busy sketching and painting. These drawings are, are beautiful, and I say that with a certain kind of modesty. Since I've had the luxury of being a cartoonist and a sketch artist all my life, I have a lot of drawing in my mind. I don't have to, to see a person lying there. I'm getting what I want, which is what? The spirit? The energy. You would know right away who these people were in a Frank Modell drawing. Wonderful at catching it at just a few lines, but he tells you everything you have to know. Not just about where they are, what they're doing, but who they are. The best ones can do that. Well, I decided early on to put them in a square. I've just always liked a square format for some reason. Well, there's something perfect about a square. I do find that I like drawing bald men and bespeckled men. Well, I grew up in Texas. My hat. And I guess that shows up pretty often. I've done a lot of cowboy cartoons. This is Bring Your Daughter to Work Day. His daughter is with him. But she's clothed. She's clothed, thankfully, <laughs> but uh, she's not enjoying it. Private Muhammad, and it's a drawing. I heard about this contest that the New Yorker was doing. We had to send in a cartoon. Um, it had to do with hotel life. Met Bob Mankoff. I won the contest, and he, he asked me if I'd been submitting, and I said no, and he said, well, you should start. So I started submitting. Uh, I did that 15 every week for the first year, and then the entire first year I sold four cartoons. Well, this is my apartment. This is my work. Mm -hmm. My work lives space. This is the living room, and also the work room. I have to show you my drawing board because I've uh, made a lot of custom specifications. A lot of people don't have a, an electric drawing board. But since I'm, you know, big time, kind of a big shot. Now these are the ones that I've sold. These are the roughs that I need to be drawing to turn into the magazine. And here's my list of finishes that I have to do. And all these are going to turn in. So to do this finish, so I would just get a nicer piece of paper, you know, a piece of Bristol, and put it over here and start working up a, a finished drawing based on that. You know, the faces are the most important part, usually, so that's where I usually start. 
I use dark pencils, like a 5B or a 6B pencil. And I sharpen them down with a razor so that they get a uh, sort of a wider point. And I use regular old Bristol paper. This is a bit of a cartoon convention, the striped boxers. I'd never used ink except my very first cartoon that I sold to the New Yorker. I used a brush and ink just because I sort of thought you had to. Right there, and then I'll do the outside stripe with this little guy. You hope that your work has a consistent look and the voice of the comedy. If it looks like it's labored, it, something doesn't work in the comedy. And that's something I have to fight against because I do labor over them. Oh, wait, I know. Got the, we've got the interior walls here. Sam. Very important to establish the perspective of the whole scene. Then you see somebody like David Cypress who dashes off these beautiful sort of childlike uh, drawings and it's perfect with his joke you know if he if he drew you know any different way I don't think it would quite work my style has been described as primitive or raw I'm completely untrained I've never been to art school I just drew the way I thought a person should draw and people have looked at my drawings and called them awkward or he can't draw and stuff like that and I love that because that's exactly not what I'm trying to do it's just the way I draw. It took me a very long time to get in New Yorker, 25 years actually, and it's what I had dreamed of since I was a little kid. To me it was a consummate moment of my life really. Right behind you there is a framed, my wife framed my first cartoon that ever appeared in the New Yorker, gave that to me as a gift. I work in a, a croquil pen point. Here, I've got one right here. There's my, ah. the tool. Dip it in the ink pot and draw with it. And I like it, what I like about it, and I've always liked about it, is that um, it's difficult to control. I love that noise. Do you? That's oh, me. it's like chalkboard. <laughs> oh no, that's the best noise in the world. The line when the you do the line is so much more character like from there to there. It's just because it's so varied. There's so many different widths and things that can happen. Anyway, maybe this time I'd make someone looking really kind of amazed at him from this end. Perhaps a woman. It's always I almost forgot to put a woman in. She's, she's kind of surprised at what she's seeing. I love to draw fire hydrants. I can't explain it, it's just an irrational thing, but anytime I draw a street scene, I always put a fire hydrant in, because I just love them. I can draw them in about 30 seconds, and they're, they kind of are a cross between a breast, a penis, and a bunch of other things, and that just, you know, I just like drawing them. I can't really explain it. And then do you redraw it when you do your final version? Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. I really think drawing is like the artist's voice. It's, it's really what makes you sound unique. And so sometimes the more you redraw something, the farther away you get from your unique voice. That's why I love the original first drawing so much. Work at night, mostly. Especially since in the winter, nothing happens here. While most cartoonists live in or near New York City, I had to travel a bit to find Ed, the cartoonist whose drawings are filled with the musings of city folk, left Manhattan long ago, relocating to a small town in Vermont. I'm at heart a countryman. I, I, I love being out in the woods as much as I like being in the city. In his home, reminders of the cartoon creatures that have become his signature. They're furry in a yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, that's true. How did they become furry? I don't furry? know. I don't really know. It's a form of evolution. It probably goes back to my delight in, in, in you know, animals, in, some, in the way people drew animals. They're anthropomorphic versions of ourselves. They're loose, very loose sort of edges. Well, they're frenetic. 
they're not not tamed. And that's also exploratory. I don't like putting a line down when when about ten thousand could do just as well. And uh, files, a box full of roughs that uh, never made it, overflowing with rejection, just rejection, rejection. This I kind of like, but that that never quite made it. The wrath index high, <laughs> but not not understood, not appreciated. Not Who knows? A fax in drawings to the New Yorker, and then. Hope, pray, think, wonder, were they this week anything? Sometimes I just sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil, and I just doodle things. Lee Lorenz is an artist my mother surely would have liked to have met. He was cartoon editor at The New Yorker for more than 20 years, in charge of saying yes or no to artists' work during the time when mom could have submitted. Now Lee's a full-time contributor again. Yeah, yeah. Now this is a this was published uh, I don't know several years ago, and I I guess I don't usually put the caption on when I send it in, but the caption is on here because I had it in a show somewhere I think. So the right, caption right, here right. is well now that the kids have grown up and left home I guess I'll be shoving along too. So there he is leaving home. This is the half tone. This is all done with brush, so which gives a nice, I think, you know, a rich line that has some texture to it. What I look for is a, a nice flow in the drawing. In a way, mine's more distinctive now because so few people draw this way anymore. Yeah, I mean. weight on the page. To me, the, the, the important thing is, is the, the eye contact, too. People, they've got to really be responding to one another. So I, I like to think that's a distinctive part of, of what I do or the way I draw. I was meant connection and interrelation between music and art is, uh, is really very, very close, and I've always had music. The drawings, I guess, tend to be quick, done, with a lot of the energy on the spot, and, and rooted in reality. I kind of see this picture, where I'm going to go with it. You don't know where I'm going to go with it yet, and I'm not going to spend much time on this but I'm getting a sense of what's going to sell the idea more than anything else. This is where the joke is. <laughs> so you see what this is so far? You get this? This is yeah. a, a cliche, right? To make it where the joke should be, I have to add the twist. Hey? There's a book I did with uh, Dick Schaap. Uh, Mort Joy wrote a book that, that could be considered a kind of Bible for people interested in cartooning. I recognized the book instantly. Which one did your mother have, the red one? The red one. Yeah, that's the 1989 edition. This is where Mom would have kept that book, here in her corner. It became her studio after she got sick and could no longer make it up and down the basement steps. I can picture her there, with lots of papers, magic markers, and a mug of tea on the ledge. And of course, plenty of old New Yorkers. She stuffed as many as she could under the chair. I'm not sure she even really read the articles. She ripped those out so she could seemingly reduce the size of her stacks. Did studying cartoon books bring her any closer to her goal? Or is cartooning an innate skill? 
I think it's something that can be learned. As I said, you know, I wrote the book and I also taught the classes, but over 15, 16 years uh, of teaching all, all those classes, I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of students came through. Maybe four or five I can think of uh, came out as becoming successful at it, for, for doing it. So it's not easy. Everyone has a favorite New Yorker cartoon, the one that makes the refrigerator door or office cubicle. The more I studied cartoons, the more I couldn't help but ask, where do the ideas come from? It's apparently a dreaded question, mainly because there is no simple answer. Cartoonist minds are wired weirdly. They bring association from different contexts and make something out of it. It's like dreaming while you're awake. You take very ordinary, familiar situations and you twist them slightly so they become completely surprising. And then you get people and yourself in that wonderful space between the familiar and the outrageous. My favorite part about drawing is when it's pretty close to the stuff that I'm thinking about in my head. It doesn't always happen like that. I mean, a lot of times there's like nothing in my head at all. It's just like one big, empty, horrible, echoey mess with like the occasional, you know, phrase like, what will I make for dinner tonight? What are these notes? Washington, D.C., via the Titan Your Beltway, broke into my nest egg and found worms. <laughs> <laughs> so those are just other ideas. Yeah. I listen to words very carefully. I do keep a, a notepad with me. I keep, you know, cards and a pen at all times. Not so much that I'll catch something that somebody else says, but that my mind will come up with something, you know, and on the subway or, you know, waiting in line at the DMV. Where do you jot your ideas down? On random pieces of paper. This happens to be a Dr. Scholl's <laughs> moleskin <laughs> that um, was in my drawer. <laughs> and uh, um, it was just close. <laughs> and I thought, if I don't write it down immediately, I'll totally forget it. Sometimes I actually draw the person talking first, then get a line of dialogue, then finish the drawing. Sometimes, though, if I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel, I'll draw something that's just completely not something I would do and then get something from there. I did a chicken and a talking egg the other day and got a cartoon out of it. It's quite fun to do that. I'll tell you the history of one of my cartoons. I have a man walking down the street. That's the subject. Then we have to have a predicate. <laughs> the predicate would be, it's a dog walking. He's holding a leash. Ah, I'm going to make it a store window. By this time, I get an idea. I'm going to make it a pet shop. And I'm going to have a cat in the window looking at the dog, safely behind the glass, going. And it was great. The cartooning is a really like a kind of meditation, just opening yourself up. And often, if you're able to do that, the ideas kind of just pop into your head. And that's a magnificent feeling when that happens. And it, but that involves a lot of sitting and staring into space and appearing to do nothing. Um, the gag is uh, the, this pirate's talking. He's saying, I was in a different place then, refers to his uh, spatula hand. And where did the idea come from? From playing with words or? I think this one came with, you know, basically saying, OK, there's, there's the cliche of pirates with a, um, with a, you know, a hook for a hand, what else could it be other than a hook? And for me, it had to still be a small, metallic sort of thing. And eventually, you know, I just wound up with a spatula, because spatulas are funny anyway. The word's funny, and just the instrument is a flappy little kitchen tool. I have all my roughs over here. This is where I keep all the roughs I've done over the years. And I have them categorized like children, couples talking, men talking, women talking, bar scenes. And these are roughs you've handed in that didn't get Yeah. Sorted. There's uh, this one, the 
host of a birthday party saying, the kids are all out back bobbing for pink eye. A lot of rejected ideas can be rethought and resubmitted. You submitted this before, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Rejection isn't always the end of the story. These are all my rejects from, say, the past year or year and a half. I would say that at least 20% of the cartoons that I sold to The New Yorker were ones that I had submitted before and then reworked or even submitted in exactly the same form. I make a notation on the back of my cartoons when I've submitted them, and some of them I've submitted three or four times, and then at a certain point I have to like, you know, face the facts and say, you know what, I don't think they like this one. This thing. I submitted a couple of weeks ago, and it, it's not a caption. It should be like a little headline here. It says, Ralston Bannister and his personal life study coach. And this is this old guy drawing this new woman. <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty good idea, but they didn't buy it. So last week, I, I redid it, and I had R. Truscott Hamilton and his personal executive trainer and this guy is teaching him how to hold his arm when he fires somebody. You know, really silly. And that day, okay. I just usually put my stuff on a pile here. I don't like to go in and see Bob because these are my little, my little gems, and I don't like to sit while somebody dismisses any of them. So I put them here, and this has been my good luck strategy in the years that I've been submitting to the magazine, and it seems to work. So. I miss the social interaction with Bob, but I get the feeling that I've done the thing that works, so... Why mess with a good thing, Why right? mess with a good thing while it's working? There is no relief from the anxiety that they may never buy another one. Every Thursday is when they call you or they don't call you to tell you whether or not you sold something. And nobody I know can honestly say that they don't stare at the phone all day. I think there is a, a kind of masochistic personality <laughs> that's drawn to this business. I always feel that their work is not as good as it could be. In other words, if you start off with a sense that you're probably not good enough anyway, rejection is a little easier to take. <laughs> I go out after the New York, I have, have lunch with these guys. Tradition of the cartoon is lunch goes, you know, all the way back. But I love the pastries, but I love the So here's a chance to at least interact and let yourself loose with other people, you know, who are going through the same agonies as you are. You know, anything. Really nice. Cartoonists have a kind of compassion for each other that guides our interactions, and that really doesn't exist in other art worlds. I actually was on my way in, the elevator doors opened, and George Booth stepped off. And I was like, hi, Mr. Booth. Uh, and he said, I said, I said, I just sold my first cartoon. And I think he said something like, well, welcome aboard. I think the common denominator is people who are cartoonists love cartooning. They were brought up by it. They can appreciate it. Each week when the New Yorker magazine would arrive, Mom and I would take turns looking at the cartoons. Then we'd try to guess each other's favorites. Sounds silly, but these are the things you remember. When I saw the stacks of cartoon collections and art books in every artist's studio I visited, I felt right at home. Some of them are references and some of them are just collections, the stuff that I just, uh, just want to have. There were the same piles she had and the same unadulterated appreciation for the cartooning great. They just look draw really well. Well, my favorite always was Steinberg. I really liked the way things began one way and turned into something else. Adams was into mood. He was also into architecture. 
He was the most clear example, in a way, of, of taking what seems to be a perfectly placid, humdrum, quotidian world and turning it on its ear. His cocktail table was a, something from a mortuary. And he collected suits of armor. He wasn't like his cartoon, but he liked to uh, play that up. It amused him to have that reputation, but that's not the kind of man he was at all. He had a very sly, dry sense of humor. I remember Charlie as a quiet man with a twinkle in his eye. One small comment, and everyone would be laughing with him. Charlie never looked like he was going to tell a joke, and so when he did tell something funny, it would be like coming over and just hitting you right in the solar plexus creeps. We I supposedly laugh inaudibly. Mom was always laughing with Charlie, trying to make him laugh, relishing his company. I'm not surprised that as she grew up, she would seek the company of other cartoonists. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Because Hello, she saw the world in an upbeat, God. offbeat way, I'm beginning to understand that meeting cartoonists must have felt to her a bit like coming home. I think we're pretty jovial. I, I, when, I don't, can't think of, I can't think of anybody that's really nasty. You don't seem to find any two alike. They have different talents. This quote apparently came from an early New Yorker writer. There is some dispute as to which magazine department was being described. The cartoonist I spoke to all felt the comment was surely aimed at them. <laughs> that describes it. I do feel that, like, if I didn't do this, I don't think I would be able to get a job anywhere else. I mean, I, I did not see myself working in an office, and, uh, I never learned to operate a cash register. There were just not a lot of things that I could do besides this. It's an, a compulsion. You know, it's, an, it's an addiction. You're glad in, in not way. to be in an office. Ha! <laughs> I, I keep thinking that that would be, you know, pretty, pretty dim. I have a friend who said, you know, hand to mouth is better than nine to five. And I tend to agree with that fairly often. It's such an anonymous profession in a funny sort of way. People look in The New Yorker and they see New Yorker cartoons, but they don't think of the artist who made it. I was on the train one time, the subway, and I was standing and there was a, a person, a guy reading this issue from this week. And I knew that, the way he was flipping through, you know, and I knew he was about to come to my cartoon, but he was, you know, taking his time. And I actually missed my stop so that I could watch him see my cartoon. And, you know, he's flipping by and he looks at it and goes, <laughs> That's all I got. Wouldn't it be funny if, like, you pulled up to this house and it was my house? <laughs> She's a cartoonist for the New Yorker. Yes. Yes, I get paid a million dollars a cartoon. Do you think that's the perception? Yes. If you have a book out, you must be loaded. Or if you've been a cartoonist for the New Yorker, oh, my gosh, you just must be rolling in dough. Cartoonists do not live in that house, nor that one. <laughs> Do you think it's getting harder to be a cartoonist? Yeah, I do. When I was coming up, there were a million magazines and lots of ways you could fool yourself into thinking that you could make a living at this. And now there really isn't, it's pretty much The New Yorker and, and nothing else. I have to get used to drawing that. It's an anxiety that you have all the time. You know, am I still, do I still have it? You know, have I lost it? You're still publishing. I consider myself extremely lucky, you know. You know, I, I am. And uh, I hope that I can continue to publish. But uh, there's no, there are no guarantees. I haven't been sure what to do with all mom's old New Yorkers. I've kept as many as I could. I've even thought about wallpapering a bathroom like my grandmother did carrying on this family tradition that will surely take a few more generations to dilute. But mom's pile of finished cartoons left one unanswered question. Did she have what it takes? 
Can I show you mom's cartoons? Sure. I so these are what I found in the basement. I could think she was out of state. Yeah. That, um, that if she kept working, see, this was got too tight. It's a matter of timing, of choreography. I like this the best. And I really like the drawing, simple drawing. I love just the little feet, you know, it's really, it's a cute cartoon. If you look at these together, you see, uh, don't you see a, a strong style and how cohesive it is? Because this is when she's working in her own, uh, in her own world, I think, more than in the other ones. I'll never know for sure if mom could have reached her goal. I'm gonna mail these to you, sweetheart. But if cartoonists say they are compelled to cartoon, I'd like to think mom was too. And maybe with more time, she would have produced something perfect for the magazine. The thing is, with or without her New Yorker dream fulfilled, my mother was lucky enough to be encouraged and supported by the cartoonists in her life. It was those friends who rallied round with colorful cards of support when she got sick, who gave her hope with humor when few others could. Cartoonists, I have learned, have that magic. We could put this behind me and I can look like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> they see comic possibility where the rest of us, mere mortals, cannot. My mother led me to these cartoonists and their passion, candor, and generosity has unexpectedly led me back to her. Mom was one of them. Even if she didn't publish with them, I know that now. She was an artist who found refuge in her work, who taught her family to love the art she loved, and who laughed as long as she could. And maybe the real joy she found in creating her art and sharing her life is ultimately more important than the dream she left undone. You want it here? You ready? Yeah. It's swoon business, cartoon business, a weird way to make dough. Writing gags by staring at the ceiling. Artistic sweat keeps pouring off our brow. Drawing talents difficult revealing. Our inks congealing. We ask, what now? We're loon people, cartoon people. We laugh when we read Poe. When at first they told us we would not go far. We didn't listen, now here we are, dreaming of okays while wishing on a star. We'll go on with what oh, and that's the end of our show. <laughs> wow.